I was 11 when I first heard The Who. Uh, that was it for me. Uh, they were my band, you know. We didn't have as many gangs back then. We had bands that we were fierce fans of, and uh, The Who was my band of choice. Um, I also liked other bands. I liked Jimi Hendrix, but it was The Who. The Who. The Who. The first time, uh, to be totally honest, was uh, since I got boned out of tickets on several other occasions, which I'll never forgive certain people for, was at the Fillmore East in 1969 in May, and uh, they were just incredible. I have never seen anything like it. I had never seen anything like it before, and nor have I seen anything like it since. Uh, they, uh, Pete had been arrested the night before. Uh, a plainclothes policeman had gone on stage of the Fillmore to warn everybody that there was a fire next door. Pete thought he was a heckler and kicked him in the balls and sent him off stage. He was arrested, spent the night in jail. I guess he was kind of cranky. Uh, my brother and I had front row seats. It was the first time we were ever going to see him, literally front row. First thing the usher said to us, came by and said, whatever you do, don't touch the stage. Never seen anything like it in my life, as I said. I, I mean, Pete Townsend, I, I don't even think he was on the ground for more than you know, a moment, you know. Just totally airborne, these acrobatics and the windmills, and he's just totally fierce. Keith Moon's drumming, you know, like a machine, you know, this human dynamo. You know, Roger, that was really the beginning of his kind of rock god phase with the, you know, the, the fringe jacket and, you know, twirling the microphone and all that. And John, you know, just standing there, you know, really solid, you know, the ox playing the bass. But and then at the end, you know, they started tearing everything up. And I did get a Keith Moon drumstick that night. But uh, never the, the performance, the end, the energy, the the impact it had on me. I'm telling you, we we walked out of the Fillmore. I, we wanted to get run over by the Second Avenue bus. We 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 swore we'd just die and go straight to rock and roll Valhalla. I suppose hearing this now, one would think this couldn't really be true. You know, this is just, you know, his version now. This is revisionism, whatever. But I had this desire. I, I was such a big Who fan. I wanted everybody to share in the experience of seeing the Who. Uh, you know, as I said, back then, you know, instead of being in a gang, you had your favorite band. You were always fighting for your favorite band. Uh, getting into rows on the school bus, whatever. You know, my band's better than your band, whatever. And um, I thought, if I could make a film about them, it, you know, maybe it could prove this point or it, at least preserve what they were doing, you know, uh, forever, I guess. I mean, there weren't a lot of rock and roll movies. Obviously, I'd seen things like Monterey Pop, which is a great movie, great um, sequence of The Who, doing my generation. I just wanted to, I guess, sum up this experience and share this experience and preserve this experience forever of The Who, being there, seeing them. I thought besides the visceral thing, of what they were about as a band live, that, that energy, uh, it was what they represented. I mean, they had contributed so much to rock and roll, even then, you know, in terms of style. I always liked their flamboyance, their look. It was always changing. They were, they were mods, and then the pop art thing, the Union Jack jacket, and then the dandy stuff with the, the, the sequins and the ruffles and all that, and, and the gear on stage, you know, the, the stacks of, of amplifiers, the mountains of amplifiers, and Keith's double kick drums, and a uh, huge set, and of course the pyro, the smoke bombs, flash pots, and, and the ritual of smashing all the instruments. They just were extremely theatrical. And, and their, their musical contributions, the mini opera, you know, Tommy, the rock opera, 
um, all that stuff. Pete is probably one of the original feedback merchants. Just and Pete is the the most articulate spokesman for rock and roll. I suppose somebody had to do it, you know, and he did it, you know. And um, to me, if there was ever going to be a movie about a band, the quintessential rock and roll band was The Who. I can't honestly recall a specific moment where I, I first kind of broached this inane idea. I just remember just asking, begging, pleading so many times. Um, and in spite of what it says on the website for the kids, were right, I wasn't crying. I didn't cry and say, Pete, break in tears. And he said, OK. Uh, it was a good story, though. Um, <laughs> so how did you get it? How did you get it? I don't know. As I said, I wore them down. I was a tremendous you know, pain in the ass, I suppose. I just wouldn't give up. I had this notion about doing this film about the I would not give up. I know it sounds ridiculous. It's it was as simple as that, as, as complicated as everything became and, and what needed to be put into place for it actually to happen. The notion of doing it, once I had that, I just kept asking. I was young and naive and I didn't know enough to realize it was impossible. I mean, now I, I would never even think about doing something like that. It was ridiculous. In the uh, continuing saga of getting this film made, the Odyssey, a uh, large part of it was trying to find enough footage to make the film. If, if we got the go-ahead, I wanted to make sure that the actual pieces were there, that uh, they existed, that they hadn't been erased, whatever, uh, that we could license them. I'm sure it wasn't even that complicated at that point. It was just finding them, making sure they existed. and. That was to convince myself that there was enough material. And then, of course, I wanted to convince The Who that it was worthwhile making this film. And I thought the best way to do that was, you know, seeing is believing and all that was the footage I had found I thought was so incredible, so entertaining that if I put together this little promotional reel for them, that, you know, maybe they would see it my way. They'd see what I was seeing, you know. And I put together, I put together this 17 minute promotional reel. The Smothers Brothers and I think some of the shindig material and odds and sods, some bits and pieces of old promo films, etc. And I managed during one of their tours to get them in a screening room in New York, show them this 17 minute promo piece that I had done with Eddie. Rothkowitz, Eddie the editor, and you know, um, got them in this editing, uh, got them to this screening room, show them the 17 minutes, and, and the, the reception was absolutely riotous. I mean, they were screaming and laughing and you know, slamming each other all over the place. And Roger's wife, Heather, knocked this coffee table over, and the chairs were going over, and the drinks were spilled, and it was absolute mayhem. And uh, I just thought, well, maybe we have something here. I know that my ability to actually shoulder the responsibilities of making the film was probably brought up on rare occasion. But Pete told me early on that if I, if I, you know, could, could, um, put up with all, um, all the craziness that I would encounter in order to, to get this project made, that he would back me. I mean, I think he wanted to see me go through this process and do it on my own, you know, convince the other members of the band, find enough footage to make it real, raise the money if need be, and keep it all together. But he said he would back me. 
and he did. He would always back me. He was he was there. Uh, he was my mentor. You know, he definitely was the the person. He was the man behind the curtain. He was the wizard. You know.